Hello and welcome to News Click. We are happy to have with us today Martin Kaur, who is heading the South Centre and a very well known name in climate change negotiations. Martin, happy to have, really good to have you with us. Thank you, thank you very much. Martin, you have been following the climate change negotiations for quite some time. You have been one of the major architects behind bringing up the concept of the carbon budget, the carbon debt, and all the items that are in the global negotiations today, particularly from the global south. Do you see the negotiations deadlocked, or do you see any momentum in the negotiations now? Well, one of the major aspects of the negotiations is to set a target for cutting global emissions by the year 2050. And the issue is if you do set a target like 50% cut for the whole world, then how do we distribute that cut? Now, the developed countries have come forward and said that they are willing to put in a figure for themselves, which is 80%, and the whole world cuts by 50%. So many developing countries ask them, yes, in your proposal, what does that mean for developing countries? Do we also have to cut? And the answer is, oh, we don't know. It's too complicated and our computers cannot handle this kind of uh, question, which of course is a very simple question with a simple answer. And the answer is that the developing countries in their proposal would also have to cut by 20%. And with population growth, the developing countries would have to cut by close to 60%. And as we know, a 50% target for the world uh, is also not enough. In fact, now uh, a new proposal has come up that the, the, the world may have to cut by 80%, especially if you want to go well below 2 degrees centigrade, say maybe 1.5 degrees, maybe even 80% is not enough. So if the world cuts by 80% and the developed countries cut by 80%, then the developing countries would also have to cut by 80% and with a per capita emission, uh, with per capita, uh, sorry, with population growth doubling in developing countries, we, we would almost have to cut by 100% per capita. So our public in the developing countries, even our academics and scientists, our policy makers, we have not yet grasped the very important issues that are being discussed in these negotiations. It's not about the environment anymore. I mean, the basis for the discussion is the environment, but this is about economics. If the developed countries have contributed maybe about two-thirds or 75 percent to the carbon dioxide and other gases in the atmosphere that are causing all these problems, then they should bear the cost of two things. One is their own very drastic cutting of emissions, and secondly, they're transferring finance and technology to developing countries so that we don't have to have the technologies and the products that they had that is so polluting. And this is the crux of the negotiations which have reached an impasse because uh, we have yet to convince the developed countries that they should take on this responsibility. Coming back to the issue of what happened in Copenhagen, one was, of course, they had an end point to the cut, but they really had no beginning point. That is, neither was the year from which they were going to cut defined, nor was any intermediate target defined. This is, in effect, was really to partition the carbon space and leaving the carbon space in two parts, one which they would get and the other which would be left for the developing countries to find over. Would you think that this is what really was a part of the problem? Well, I think the negotiators at the level of the diplomats and experts from the developing countries, uh, many of them knew enough. And what they were saying is, we cannot agree to a 50% cut or even a 2 degrees limit unless simultaneously we agree to how much you're willing to pay the developing countries to do their bit and how much you yourself are willing to cut. Because if you are willing to cut by too little, then we have to bear all the burden and then you have to give us more money and technology so that we can do the job. So this question has to be discussed in a package. You cannot decide beforehand that you cut by 50% globally. Now in Copenhagen, because the negotiators knew enough to want a package deal, 
the Prime Minister of Denmark convened a meeting of 25 political leaders who did not know all these details in the hope of ramming through what the developed countries wanted, which is please agree to a 50% global cut and the rich countries will cut by 80%. In fact, this was what Andrew Merkel kept pushing. And they were very angry that some countries like China, India said, we can't do this because we will agree to the global cut only after we get the framework for how do we share this, uh, this burden of, uh, of the global cut, who is going to cut by how much and how are you going to help the developing countries. So as a result, we didn't quite get this. So in Copenhagen, this issue of the figures were not settled. And thank goodness, because if we had settled it, then we would have locked in not only the carbon budget, but the distribution of burden of implementing the carbon budget. And it would have been very inequitable against the developing countries. Now, after Copenhagen, the chair of the group that is discussing this has come out with a paper that again repeats in a, in, in a worse way what the developed countries were trying to do in Copenhagen. And that is why it is so important that our policy makers get to understand this carbon budget, meaning between now and 2050, how much can the earth bear in terms of additional units of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and who should be given the rights to this carbon dioxide emissions, and how the developing countries should be helped practically in order to do their part. The other part of this is the we seem to be in a situation that we cannot have a pact on climate without the United States. But if we get the United States in the negotiations, in any severe sense, then we don't seem to get any carbon, any climate change pact at all. So would you think the time has come for the rest of the world to decide, OK, let's look at a global camp, a compact without the United States and hope that the United States will join later? I think so, because uh, we already did that when the United States left the Kyoto Protocol some years ago. The key decision was made by all the other countries that instead of dissolving the Kyoto Protocol, we would carry on with it. And in fact, in Bali two years ago, this was the, un this was the understanding. We knew that the United States would never join the Kyoto Protocol. So it was agreed that all of us would remain in the Kyoto Protocol. The developed countries who are in the Kyoto Protocol, everyone except the United States, would continue to pledge what is adequate and to bind it inside the Kyoto Protocol and the developing countries who would not have to take binding emission reductions would step up and do more than they would do in the past and as for the United States, even the US agreed that although they are not in the Kyoto Protocol, they would do a comparable effort to the others who are in the Kyoto Protocol uh, but unfortunately, the U.S. is now saying that uh, they don't even recognize this comparable effort. Today, we have a situation after Copenhagen where the whole climate regime is in a disarray because the United States has managed to persuade most of the other developed countries to step down from the Kyoto Protocol and each one to just pledge what they want to do on a more or less voluntary basis. And these pledges have now come in. And the figures are horrendous. They show that, uh, uh, you know, instead of cutting the emissions by 40%, there will be a cut of emissions by perhaps only 10%. And with loopholes and so on, according no to a, not only no emissions cut, the emissions may actually increase by 6% of the developed countries alone. So we are facing a, a very disastrous situation from the environmental point of view. Looking at Obama's political uh, equilibrium in the United States, if I may, it doesn't look like he's in any position to do anything substantive on the climate change. So don't you think the time has come for the world really to now start talking about without the US we have to go forward? And this is something which has still not come through very strongly in any part of the globe. I think this is the position which, uh, which I would take anyway, and I see that many NGOs uh, in Bonn two weeks ago, they took this same position. They said that we should move ahead without the United States. In other words, the other developed countries that had been under the discipline of the Kyoto Protocol, they should now uh, follow, themselves follow, from the United distance States. themselves from the U.S. 
make pledges that are adequate and that are not contingent on the United States. Thank you, Martin. This has been really good having you with us. Hope that we meet you more when you visit India and have such discussions again. Thank Thanks. you very much.